haven't made that announcement, but since I'm here, this is what's happening. So. Well, um, I was scared okay. to teach this topic. <laughs> I've got the topic of abortion, so, you know, fun topic. I was scared before Hiram was going to be a girl. So uh, we're talking about abortion tonight, and I want to approach this more from the standpoint of us articulating kind of our position when we're dealing with uh, other people. Um, I have no background, educationally or professionally, in the medical field or any other discipline related to this, so please correct me if I misrepresent the science somehow. I did, I did research. I like to research. It's kind of a hobby, but I'm, I don't science. So if any of you in here science, help me out. Also, I'm going to assume that we're already, most of us in here are already are alive. Um, because of that, part of addressing opposing viewpoints is understanding their viewpoint and then um, doing it justice. So if, if any of you feel that I'm misrepresenting an opposing viewpoint, please stop me and you know better inform me. That would be good for all of us because at the end of the day, we're not just trying to shut somebody down, make them feel dumb, or win an argument. We care more about how God feels about how precious life is, uh, and we care about those who are most vulnerable, not just winning an argument. So with that in mind, uh, we'll look at this study a little bit. So we advocate against abortion based on a belief that life begins at conception. Um, therefore, abortion is perfect because you're taking a human life that doesn't deserve have their life taken. So the pro-life position can most simply be stated uh, as a syllogism. So the first premise, abortion is murder, because you're taking a human life um, that doesn't deserve to be taken. The second is that murder is wrong. Therefore, the conclusion, abortion is wrong. Now, where we differ, where, where pro-life advocates differ, pro-choice advocates, uh, is the major premise, that is that abortion is murder. So when we're having a discussion with someone, uh, we have to try to establish the legitimacy of that, that first point. Excuse me. So before we begin the first section of this class, which I'm, I'm hoping will help us kind of articulate the position or maybe at least get information about it, um, it's important to point out that a lot of people's beliefs um, are tied, especially in this day and age, to identity politics on either side of the aisle. Everyone is guilty of this in some way. Um, in this day and age, morality is often adopted based on um, which kind of section of society we align ourselves with. I know this is not always the case, but it's often the case often enough that um, I think it's best for a discussion like this to be had with someone that we've established rapport with. I'm not going to just walk up to some random person on the street and uh, grill them on their position uh, about the sanctity of life or abortion or, or that topic. That is not likely to go anywhere except to engender, you know, resentment. So for what we're talking about tonight, at least this first part, which is kind of articulating our position, this is a conversation that we should have with a friend or a coworker or a neighbor that we've built a relationship of trust with. Because what we're trying to do at the end of the day is change lives for the better and hopefully bring people closer to God and, you know, picking a fight with someone who doesn't know how much we care, so they don't care how much we know. That, that's not usually going to go anywhere. It just makes uh, us look kind of bad. So for the first section of this class, I want to kind of look at articulating our argument and again. Um, if I'm inaccurate in any way on the science or the in opposing viewpoint, please stop me and educate me. I'd love to have a discussion um, about this. I do know what God says. For the, for the sake of this class, we're trying to deal with um, approaching people who do not accept the Bible as an authoritative source, who may in fact be hostile to the Bible, and who in, in some cases don't even view science as being relevant to the discussion. So this is kind of a hairy topic to begin with, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this area. So, one more caveat, and then we'll actually get into the material. Uh, giving a science lesson when we're having a discussion about this with someone is not usually going to go anywhere uh, too far. Uh, the attention spans of our species have kind of tanked over the last few decades. Uh, so, going through a full-blown science lesson is not the best way to keep attention, for one thing, and if you're like me, uh, they could throw out an opposing viewpoint that I have no way to challenge because I have no experience in that field more of a literature guy, um, so science is, is not my strength. If it's your strength, awesome, you are, you're good to go. So what I've tried to do is um, look at some easily researchable truths. You can say look this up or give them a legitimate source if they're interested in doing so. Um, and I think it's important to look at neutral sources. If you're doing your own research, it's important to look at neutral sources. So 
not pro-life websites, not pro-choice websites, look at um, like NIH, for example, and Science Direct. Uh, you can keyword search peer-reviewed scientific publications and, and look for studies that uh, discuss these aspects in embryology or cloning um, or genetic mutation or birth, birth defects and so on, and use observations from those unrelated studies so that confirmation bias um, doesn't come into play. Again, we, we know what we believe as Christians on this subject, but we're attempting to have a discussion that kind of posits irreputable points in their minds as well. So here are kind of a couple of the key ways that we can establish the first premise, which is that abortion is murder. So uh, murder being the uh, premeditated, intentional act of taking a person's life who was in, an innocent person's life, excuse me. Ooh, Ira, man, I am scared to death. All right. <laughs> I don't know any more about it than you from the science standpoint, so. <laughs> I had to do two hours of research to decode your research, so. Um, we know a lot more. Anyways, uh, so articulating our argument. I, I, I found that this is, hopefully I'll say this correctly is what I'm trying to say. And again, for those of you science people, let me know if I get this wrong. So the scientific consensus generally is that healthy cells, all healthy cells, come from a single genetic blueprint, that individuals have a unique DNA set. And uh, there are some exceptions to this. From what I understand, it's called mosaicism. Uh, and this is brought up uh, by those who are pro-choice advocates, or at least some of them. Uh, but mosaicism, which is more than one um, unique DNA set in a single person, um, that almost always results in serious health conditions that often lead to death. So uh, general scientific consensus is that healthy cells all have one distinct genetic blueprint. Next piece of the puzzle, fertilization makes a zygote which has its own unique DNA. I can say that right, because this is a weird word. Um, at this point, so right after fertilization, we're talking about like I think two or three days after um, initial fertilization, we're talking about something that has its own identity. It has its own um, DNA. It is no longer part of mom. It's not half dad, half mom. It's its own thing. Uh, so we're talking about a unique, separate individual. This is life. It is the definition of life. Um, general scientific consensus is that from the point of conception up to about eight weeks, this is an embryonic stage, uh, after that point it's considered a fetus uh, by eight to 10 weeks, all organs are present and the child has unique fingerprints. So we're not dealing with something like cancer cells. I've heard this said multiple times that you know, pregnancy is no different from like a cancer cell because you know, cancer cells have a DNA uh, profile of some kind and they replicate just like the cells of the fetus. So again, I am way out of my league in this one. I'm just trying to make sense of this for, for the average person. Maybe. Bottom line is that, we'll talk about this a little bit, later on in this lesson, but Roe v. Wade established that abortion cannot be restricted in any way up to the 12th week, so the first trimester. It's no questions asked if a woman would like to have an abortion in her first trimester, she may do so for any reason at all. It cannot be restricted. The problem is all of the signs of life and complete individuality are seen from not only the point of conception, but I mean, you, heartbeats are detectable at full weeks. And if all the organs and fingerprints are there at eight weeks, we have no business killing a life, an actual life, with a unique DNA profile at up to 12 weeks without question. And again, multiple states like Virginia and New York, and I'm sure a few others, have even legalized um, abortion after the baby has actually been born. So this has been taken way further than it needs to go. And what we're trying to do with all of this um, noise is to establish that what we're dealing with, what's being terminated, is not a clump of cells, but actual life. Not just because you know, the Bible says that it's life, uh, which it does, but um, it's important because it's general scientific consensus for people who have no skin in this game. This is not their argument, necessarily. Um, general scientific consensus is that this is life, and this is unique. So taking a human life without cause, uh, like a self-defense or a neck war, um, that's wrong, it's murder. All right, so I bring this up because many pro-choice advocates will say something like, my body, my choice. Um, we've heard that a lot over the last several years, but science overwhelmingly demonstrates that even um, a fetus before the eighth week 
So definitely from conception, but even as early as four weeks, it was something that higher madness knows. Um, even at, as early as four weeks, it is completely distinct. Uh, and it's, it's not, no longer part of the woman's body. So she can't say, my body, my choice. Uh, it's not her body at that point. So this is a difficult conversation to have. And again, why I suggest we probably bring this up only with people that we're, we're very close to and have a, a relationship built on trust. All right. What did I get wrong? How could this be improved? This is something that hopefully we can all work through because what we're trying to do is, what my my goal with this was to take a, maybe a little bit of a different approach when we're discussing a very difficult conversation um, with someone who has an opposing viewpoint to ours. What, we're, what I would like to try to avoid in a conversation personally is any indication of hostility. <clears throat> we don't hate people, hopefully, who hold viewpoints that are different than our own. All we're trying to do is um, really protect the vulnerable is one of those things, and then eventually bring them closer to God. Um, we can't do that if we come across as combative, and, and I don't want to do that. But we also don't want to take our entire argument from the standpoint of what the Bible says, because we're going to lose it immediately. They don't even consider the Bible to be a legitimate, a legitimate source. So falling back on some pretty basic principles that you're not – terminating the clump of cells, that science has come a long way since 1973. Um, that's that's kind of what the goal is. Right. So if that made any sense to y'all, that's, that's hopefully designed to establish the first point, that abortion is not just getting rid of the clump of cells. Go for it. First, I want to apologize for joining the college class and making a comment. But <laughs> um, I guess um, I think in the realm of you talking about things, um, but at some point in our lives, whether we're in college or high school, sometimes we run into people that we love that, or that we know personally that have gone through something very similar. Maybe they're not trying to make a decision. Maybe that decision has already been made. Right. Um, and so how do you talk to that Christian or, or the non-Christian that has already made that choice? I think it's important that we as Christians approach it in a manner of there's redemption and forgiveness. And if we can't um, when that person has a hard time living with that decision, there is redemption from that decision. Um, when they finally realize, I know that this wasn't right, and maybe that happened at a younger age, and I've got something personal in my life that was a minor, and the decision was actually the parents and not theirs. So although it's their body, it wasn't their choice because they were minors living in their home. And the parents were like, we are, you're not having a baby, and we're taking you here. Right. Therefore, that was a, that person's had a hard time throughout their life thinking, what choice did I have? Mm -hmm. You know, my parents were saying, I had to. Right. But they've come a really long way with forgiving and grace and forgiveness. And I think if we come from that standpoint versus biblical stuff, because I do think we all as humans know it's not okay. But what is going on in that person's life that got them to that point or to that decision? So... You actually, uh, I can cut that whole section out at the end. That, that was Hiram had very good points, like at the very end, it's like, your conclusion, man, which is boom, 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 these really powerful points. It's really, really getting fired up while I was reading them. But he mentions, he mentioned everything that you just said for the most part was. Sorry, still your laundry. No, that's okay. Just, that's okay. Uh, if something just feels weird about using Hiram's material to I just, I didn't think I was going to be here, so I said, well. No, I, no, I didn't. I'm glad you're in the class because, um, again, you clearly know what you're talking about. And I, I clearly do not. <laughs> so, for situations where we're, we're dealing with someone who um, not necessarily is, is struggling with guilt, perhaps, but is just an advocate or an ally of that position, um, we have to try to somehow demonstrate that, that life, that this is a life that can kill that's not okay. I kind of I think we all agree on that second premise, regardless of where we kind of fit on that spectrum of belief. Um, taking an innocent life is wrong. Period. Something that I've heard from people who will say they like in church mm -hmm. that you know the, the type of person that you love, but they have a different perspective, okay. and they will they'll say the exact same thing. Like yes, it's wrong. And then they'll say but they'll say. They're gonna. Women who want to have abortions are going to find a way to do it mm -hmm. that is unsafe and isn't going to be good for them. Uh, yeah, and so they'll the they'll say like, if you 
make it against the law completely, then you're hurting those people too. And so like, then you have people that agree, yes, it's wrong, but, and then they'll throw in the button. So it's like, what do you say to that? That is a phenomenal question. I gave some I'm just, thought. I'm not really <laughs> asking you to answer. I'm just like throwing it out there like that. I don't know if anyone else has heard that, but it's like, I have. It's yes. like, it's hard to, especially someone who agrees that, yeah, it's wrong, but because of a different political spectrum, they're arguing for the but reason why their side does legal. that. Yeah. Um, I'll say something very quickly, and then Iron can say something very intelligent. So, um, <laughs> following that line of reasoning, then most laws should not be in place, uh, either to protect something or to allow something, because people could potentially misuse it. Um, the same line of reasoning has been used for um, controversial issues like gun control, um, regardless of where you feel about that. Christians were. That doesn't really apply to our internal states, so we can we can disagree on that point and still love each other. Um, but you know, some people argue that law should be a lot stricter in regards to possession of or um, ownership of a firearm because people can misuse them and people do misuse them. Um, others say that people are going to disobey the law whether they want to or not. So the legal status, I don't think, makes much of a difference. Uh, if a person is bent on doing something harmful, they'll do it regardless. I was going to say. Pretty much that same thing in that in that situation the question isn't okay well if someone if we can agree that it's a life and that it's murder mm -hmm. then the next step would be not to say well let's put a law in place to help somebody do something that's unjust it would be less like Ms. Chris was saying attack the trauma where people feel like this is their only out right. and let's talk about some practical things we can do of course there will always right. be some people that slip through the cracks and choose to do otherwise but you know, the response to that is, okay, if somebody wants to go to the back alley, like what can we do to help that person not get there? Even if they decide not to have the child, there are plenty of people that want to adopt and there's just a host of things that we can do, but the answer can't be for any unjust activity. Well, since people are gonna do that anyway, let's create a sort of framework where they can just kind of sin delicately because otherwise they're gonna do it anyway and it's gonna create more harm and it's kind of a straw man argument. I mean, you don't know that to be the case. That's just something we assume that this person's going to just go and do this. But what if they had no other out? And then the op you could argue the opposite because we're just arguing invisible things at this point. What if they had no other choice and they decided, well, since there is no safe way to do it, I'm going to keep the child now and just gird up my loins and do what I can. So you, you just wouldn't know. It's easy to reason toward the negative. But what if tearing down all of those outlets turns a person to a positive possibility. I'm really glad you're in here. <laughs> Did that answer your question? That is cool. I'm very glad. So let's move on. Um, the second stage, I guess, of this discussion is talking about um, murder is bad. I mean, that, that seems like a no, no duh. It's like no low hanging fruit kind of stuff. But I think it's important to define murder. Because just coming out and saying that, I should probably clarify this since I'm saying it public in front of other people. Um, probably not the best approach just to just out and say, oh, so you're fine with just murdering people. That's inflammatory and I don't know. What it is, that is the case. But calling someone a murderer just out and out, that's not usually going to be well received by even the most well-adjusted people. So for the sake of this discussion, we're talking about the wrongful death of innocent person. So premeditated actually is probably a better thing than certain premeditated wrongful death of an innocent person. So someone who hasn't done anything wrong, they don't deserve to die at all. So no one's going to argue that murder is okay, and if they do argue that it's okay, you should probably find someone else to be in a hurry. So we're looking at the most vulnerable population. What we're trying to posit with them is to reinforce that first point that we made. Um, abortion is the unjust taking of an innocent life. Taking an innocent life is already recognized by every society on the planet as being morally wrong. So if taking a life without very good cause, like you're in imminent peril because of another person's actions, um, if taking a life for no reason is considered wrong by every country in the world and every country that's ever existed, um, why would we think it's okay to take advantage of the most vulnerable in our society? Um, another thing I found that was very interested, interesting, um, any people in here into, excuse me, into like law stuff so I could be a lawyer or have studied how law works. Right. Does 
that a kind of business law as far as I business know. law? Okay. Well, huh. Wikipedia has been my education thus far mm -hmm. on the law side of things. What I found was that, and if anyone here has alternate information, stop me. Um, children seven and under are not actually considered capable of committing crime. Um, so they're actually not held liable for anything that they do, seven and under. So they're considered innocent by the laws of this country and several other countries as well. So um, what that means in 38 states in this country is that if someone attempts to harm or bring serious harm to a person aged seven and under, no questions asked, a non-aggressor in that situation, so an innocent bystander, can use any means necessary to prevent that crime from occurring, up to and including deadly force. So if in almost all states, and even in the states that don't have standard ground laws, which is where this comes from, even in the 12 states that don't have standard ground laws, concessions are made for the extremely vulnerable in a lot of cases. Um, okay, so here's what, how the law kind of reads in most of the states. It provides that people may use up to and including deadly force when they reasonably, reasonably believe it to be necessary to defend against deadly force, great bodily harm, kidnapping, rape, or in some jurisdictions, robbery and other serious crimes. So kind of summarized, um, civilians are allowed to intervene and use any force necessary to stop a child from being harmed by another person when they're age. I mean, no questions asked when they're age seven and under, and you're not gonna have a case, uh, the, the aggressor will not have their case standing for um, under a certain age. So if even our secular law recognizes that in most states in this country, and even in the states that don't recognize this officially, have concessions for that. It's just kind of like a basic human nature thing. Duh, you take care of vulnerable people. If we recognize that already, why does that not apply to the overall? Especially when it can be very easily posited that they are a viable life. They are unique individuals. All right, before we get to the conclusion, this section that this, these couple of paragraphs that I'm about to talk about, um, this only applies when we're very familiar with the person that we're talking to. We're talking to. Um, it's very important that we don't assume what people believe um, rather than say, oh, you know, I think you're from choice, therefore you also believe all of these other things. That is not the case. This section applies when we actually have a relationship with this person or where they have stated that these other, um, these other viewpoints are also theirs. So, Hopefully that will all make sense in about 30 seconds. So a lot of pro-choice advocates also claim to be against violence of any kind. Uh, they will often be against um, use of force by police, um, civilians owning firearms or using deadly force of any kind. Um, they might be, they're usually against war, so there's no such thing as justifying the war. Uh, the death penalty, uh, they view it as being uh, barbarian, a relic of the past that we need to get rid of. Um, even for a lot of them, hunting is something that's barbaric and should not be corrected. It's more of a law. When those are the case, like if you know a person and you know that they also have those feelings, which in and of themselves, I don't know that they're necessarily bad. I don't see any of these things as being a salvation issue. Uh, but it, just to point out an inconsistency, it, if, if violence is always so wrong, why is it okay to take it as So um, again, this, this <laughs> This little section right here is, is for when we're already aware that those two points are held by the person that we're talking to. So, um, the conclusion. Hopefully this makes my rambling a little bit more clear. So this is kind of the summary argument. Um, briefly summarize the arguments to form a conclusion that backs the person into an intellectual form. Because again, I'm not talking about what was mentioned earlier, uh, someone who's struggling with guilt. That is a totally different conversation. This is in the context of uh, someone who, um, I, for no, probably no malicious reason at all, has a certain viewpoint that includes uh, pro choice. So, first part, uh, fetus is a distinct individual um, at conception, but certainly no later than eight weeks, uh, which the law certainly protects. Therefore, they have the same rights that any other person enjoys. Second, murder is always wrong, uh, since a fetus is a person and is incapable of doing anything to deserve death. Abortion is by default. Finally, since the fetus is a distinct human, murder is wrong, abortion is therefore wrong. It's, it's oversimplification, but it's kind of the, hopefully the foundation of moving a discussion forward uh, in, the, in the context that we have tonight. Questions, comments, um, counterpoints, since we have higher maturity, we can answer things. Yes. Um, I have a question. Is, 
it's like uh, something I've been told all my life, but I've never really looked into it like that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I really hope the answer is yes. But do all babies go to heaven? Yes. Okay, great. Iron? Do you have references off the top of your head? Children are innocent. Um, they, they can't commit sin. I know Romans 3, all of sin. We're, we're talking about people who have recognized that there's a law. Uh, Paul said the power of the sin is in the law. So you have to be capable of recognizing that something is wrong in order to do something wrong. Um, maybe you can't do that. But if you have any references off the top of your head that you can give. Yeah, I'll go to Romans 9, and I believe it's about verse 11. Um, Paul is talking about Esau and Jacob, and he says when they were both in the womb and had neither done good nor evil, and so he's speaking to their innocence even when they're in the womb. One more thing, he talks about them like they're people in the womb. But anyway, yeah, that's a reference. Oh, that's awesome. That's good. Thank you. This Gary, I do funny. have a comment. Go for um, it. Before I moved from Florida, there was a clinic, an options for women clinic, and it was basically a pro-life clinic designed to um, give people another option outside of abortion. Hey, consider pro-life, and these things would be set up, these buildings would be set up next to abortion clinics. And sometimes because of the name options for women, when people had an abortion schedule, they would go to the options for women's place accidentally. And we were able to work with them and have some Bible studies and baptize some girls and stuff. I'm saying that to say when they would go in that clinic, found out they were in the wrong place, they would give them information like you've done tonight. And we might assume, even people that we know or we don't know, that people that think this way, their minds are made up, they're set. But a lot of the information you gave tonight was very well done, and some people have never heard of the other side. And so because of that, when these girls would be sat down or when they would see the ultrasound, that just revolutionized what they thought about things, and they realized, man, there's something else that I can do. And so. I'm just saying we should think more when we talk to people in a hopeful way and not thinking, you know, people got their minds made up. This is how they are. I mean, these were people on their way to get an abortion. They weren't. This wasn't some intellectual coffee shop discussion. And yet sometimes the women's minds were changed and some things like that. And so oh, that's awesome. I think the information you gave is good and it backs that up. And we shouldn't just take this like, well, I'm never going to meet anybody where this makes sense. It will. You never know what, what might happen. So also know that um, medical stuff is changing to um, not only surgical intervention for abortions but morning after pills so things will vastly change to where um, instead of having to go to have surgical intervention they are offering if the female has a pregnancy test that is positive they have up to so many weeks that they can actually take a pill that actually will abort the child so it's easier to access yes that. And so there's, you know, provided these, they shut these surgical places down. There's that. Uh, there is an actual local uh, nonprofit in town called the Hope Pregnancy Center. Um, we actually just had a meeting with, I work for nonprofit, so um, they came and spoke about what they did, and they do exactly what he was talking about. It's a center where women can come, get an ultrasound for free. They they do all these free services to try to come uh, to just uh, nurture the whole pregnancy and the whole mothering thing. However, quickly after she told us all the positives, she just did tell us that if they decided to go in the abortion route, that they still supported. And this was a Christian. This is a Christian-based facility, nonprofit. But. Interesting. Wow. <coughs> Thank you for smart things <laughs> that were just said. All right, so also from Hiram Kemp, this is straight from his material, so I'm not going to take credit for it. The next section I want to look at is kind of the history of it briefly, um, just to kind of explain. Let me start over. This for me was kind of eye opening. I had not seen a lot of this before. I just knew it was a decision where the Supreme Court said you can do it and go for it. Um, but I didn't realize how it was phrased and uh, the kind of loopholes that states were allowed to take as a result of the wording in the Supreme Court decision. So I think it's important to kind of look at it because of which constitutional amendment they decided to land on and uh, the way that they phrased it and compared it to other fundamental rights that I don't necessarily think was the best approach at all. I mean, obviously there's no good approach to legalizing this, but um, it was helpful for me, it was eye-opening for me and just kind of highlighted some inconsistencies 
So first, um, Roe versus Wade was passed in 1973. There was a decision made by the Supreme Court which ruled that the Constitution protected a woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. So they, they decided that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment provides a right to privacy that protects a woman's right to choose whether or not to have an abortion. Um, the 14th Amendment is like the naturalization. If you're born in the States or you're legal, you legally immigrate to the States, then you have the rights, the same rights as other people in the States. The 14th Amendment was called on uh, to um, also positive, if I remember correctly, like anti-discrimination bills, uh, protection of marriage, um, anti-slavery bills. Um, that's kind of what they tie that to. So abortion was just as fundamental a right as what they said as the right to not be made a slave, as the right to not be discriminated against based on um, ethnicity, country of origin, you know, gender, whatever. Um, kind of seems a little bit uh, backwards, at least in my mind. So the defense outlined three things. In the first trimester of pregnancy, no state can prohibit an abortion. Let's just kind of call it with that. Uh, second trimester of pregnancy, you can put some reasonable health regulations in place and during the third, Governments are allowed to prohibit abortions as long as they provide exceptions for cases where an abortion is necessary to save the life or health of the mother. Um, now that sounds like it's just talking about like ectopic pregnancies. Uh, I'm not extremely familiar with them, but I'm aware that they almost always, if not always, end in the death of both uh, mom and baby if no intervention takes place at all. So intervention, I mean ectopic pregnancies are going to be tragic regardless, but the intervention would require uh, terminating the pregnancy to save the mom, because there's no way mom's gonna survive. And in an ectopic pregnancy, there's no way baby's gonna survive either. But that's not what this does. There's enough of a loophole in there that states kind of ran with it and said, oh, well, it doesn't, you know, it didn't specify whether or not we're talking about mental health. So you could say something like, well, I don't feel like this would be good for my mental health. And therefore, as late as your third trimester, um, you could have an exception for an abortion. I see it. Oh, okay, got my hopes up. Um, the court classified this, as I stated, as a fundamental right, which requires courts to evaluate challenges to the abortion law under the strict scrutiny standard. This is where I had to do research to decode his research. Um, so this is apparently the highest level of judicial review. Again, correct if I'm wrong on any of this. Um, but from what I understand, there's a spectrum of scrutiny asking, like, how literal do we take this? How important is this? What are the ramifications? And the three basic levels are rational basis, intermediate and strict. So strict applies, from what I understand, to government actions or laws, and it's utilized when constitutional rights are challenged. For example, anti-discrimination laws, um, anti-slavery laws, and marriage. So if someone says, I really don't like this anti-slavery stuff, you know, I, I kind of want slaves again, just then the strict scrutiny says basically, you ain't challenging this law. You're going to be left out of court. So <clears throat> abortion was given those same protections, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and Laws like anti-discrimination laws, anti-slavery laws, and freedom of marriage, because interracial marriage was not even officially legal in this country until 1967, which is ridiculous. Uh, but putting abortion in that category just doesn't seem right. Anyways, that level of scrutiny makes abortion laws very difficult, if not impossible, to challenge. While the other laws are fantastic, the abortion law, uh, not so much. So the Supreme Court essentially stated that the right to an abortion is just as fundamental as the right to freedom. That's, that's not. As an aside, again, correct me if I'm wrong, OBs usually treat moms and babies as two separate patients, mom and fetus as two separate patients with distinct medical needs and unique approaches to treatment. But if a woman decides to terminate her pregnancy, that magically disappears. Suddenly we're not dealing with two patients, we're dealing with one. What causes a person to cross that line, and why does that fact suddenly disappear? That, that's a question I'm actually asking out loud. Um, I was not able to find a satisfactory answer, you know, for why that justification was in place. Why is a, as a pregnant mom, obviously, uh, considered two patients? But if she says that she wants to terminate pregnancy, she's no longer considered two patients, just one. That's just inconsistent. There's so many inconsistencies in this whole system. And the level of protection that it was given right out the gate, before we had the medical technology we have today even, is reckless at best. So not even arguing this from a, a biblical standpoint, just from a legal and civil liberty standpoint, there's a lot of flaw behind the writing of this, this law. Um, really, any rational person would want to challenge something like that. Did I do okay on the strict scrutiny thing? Hiram, those are your notes. 
Moving on. So, for us, this is probably important. Actually, how much time do I have? Six minutes. Oh, boy. Five minutes. Oh, boy. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so Old Testament, we'll just look at a few verses. We already know a lot of this stuff. I think it's important to look at it, though. Um, when Israel was going into the Promised Land, they were to kick out the Canaanites because they practiced several sins. Among them was child sacrifice. No, they're not okay with that. Leviticus 21 through 5. Also, this is Hiram's material, if I haven't already said it. Uh, 2 Kings 21, 5 through 6, and verse 16. Manasseh was considered evil because he uh, burned his own son to death as part of idol worship. God called this filling the land with innocent blood. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 28.3, uh, King of Ahaz practiced child sacrifice, so God let him get captured uh, by his enemies. Jeremiah 19, 4 and following, says, They have abandoned me, and they've made this a place to follow up foreign gods. Um, we'll skip the, they filled this place with the blood of innocent people. They built high places to Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, which I never commanded or mentioned. In fact, it never crossed my mind. So watch out. Um, the Lord says that someday people will call this the Valley of Slaughter. Um, what I will do. Proverbs 6, 16-19, God hates people who spill innocent blood. This one stood out to me a lot because we don't think of a loving God as being someone who is capable of hate. Um, but people who spill innocent blood, um, they're on the receiving end of the most powerful force in the universe. So uh, that's something that's important to understand. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and make sure they get justice. All right. So this one was cool. Hiram, thanks for pointing this one out. In the New Testament, the same Greek word is used for both born and unborn babies. Breakfast. Uh, which I always thought, when I was studying Greek in uh, preaching school, I always thought of breakfast. Uh, it's not important at all. I just thought it was breakfast. Babies want to eat all the time. Breakfast is food. Breakfast. Never mind. Uh, so for examples where it's used of... Um, baby that is born, Luke 2, 12 and 16, 1 Peter 2, 2, and Luke 18, 5, and of a baby that is still in the womb, Luke 1, 41 and 44. God sees them as being equally human and equally alive, because that's just as facts before. So Herod is exposed as a homicidal maniac in Matthew 2, 16 through 18, because he ordered the death of all children to and under. Um, Jesus used the moral innocence of children as an example of that. Adults should follow Matthew 18, 3 through 4, and Matthew 19, 13 and 14. Uh, and murder is clearly condemned in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. And you can't go to heaven as a murderer unless you change your ways. 1 John 3, 15. All right, so in two and a half minutes. Yep, I'm going to do it anyways. How should we interact with pro-choice advocates or people who have had abortions? What should we say to them? How should we engage them? <clears throat> I think kind of the theme of this like semester has been we need to like uh, grow relationships with people that don't like think the same way that we do. We don't need to necessarily distance ourselves or put up a barrier. We need to try to build relationships with them so you have a place to say something because if you if you don't have a relationship with somebody you're obviously like we all know you're gonna come off really like strong and me not loving and kind and caring for like you're act like you want to help or you want to understand better and whenever you have a relationship with somebody you can obviously show that you want to understand if you don't know the person then that is not what you're trying to do we're more likely to influence them when they know who actually care about them. I've got this is a question. Based on what you were saying about the strict law aspect, the scrutiny side, yes. do you think this is just a personal opinion question? You don't have to answer it. Maybe the bell will save you. Do you think there's any hope of abortion being overturned legally based on that? Um, I looked into this briefly. Uh, there was, I can't remember the name of the amendment off the top of my head. Uh, maybe one of y'all did. The amendment that prohibited the sale of alcohol in the United States during the Prohibition. Um, it was not only wildly ineffective, it also increased violence in major cities at an enormous scale. Um, and actually, for those of us who like to play with pew pews every once in a while, made things very uncomfortable for us if you want to buy things that go pew pew very quickly. I'm talking about a lot of this for those of you who aren't into guns. Um, bottom line is, the law was considered so ineffective and so dangerous after 
um, several years of looking at the effects that it had, that it was overturned. And while the consumption of alcohol is not something that would necessarily praise at all, um, I do think there's hope that the law can be overturned and it would at least make things more difficult. Um, very quickly, just as an example, um, in Colorado, when I was, I think, like 15 or 16, they legalized um, recreational use of marijuana. And they said, well, people are going to smoke weed regardless. And that was true, but the, the line for people outside of the dispensaries, once like the day the law was, was passed and made active, the line was over a mile long, most of which were first time or never had used marijuana in their lives before. So you can't legislate morality to a certain extent, um, but at the same time, when, if that law could be overturned in some way, I do think it would it would put measures in place that would prevent most people. Because like I said, that, that line, most people that took advantage of the recreational marijuana laws in Colorado had never used them, had never used weed before, or had, had never tried weed before. So for, I think, the rank and file of people, knowing that something is illegal discourages the person from doing that thing because they don't want to face the consequences of that action. So, well, that's not always the case because obviously we have prisons for a reason. Um, I do think that being able to overturn that will, and that's just my, that's my opinion, but I think being able to overturn Roe v. Wade um, would be beneficial in that area. Thank you guys for putting up with the train wreck that was in this class. Um, thank you, Hiram, for being in the class, and I hope that this was at least in some way informative. You all have an awesome time. Thank you.